Date with a Debut is a Words and Nerds and Breathe Art Podcasts co-production recorded on a Wapical country. And I pay my respects to all elders, past and present, and extend that to any First Nations people tuning in. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. On with the show. Welcome to Date With A Debut, a podcast about debut authors, their incredible books, and their journey to publication. If you are looking for a new author to discover or writing inspiration for your own story and you don't know where to start, this is the place to be. I'm Nick Wasiliev, author of When Men Cry and your host for today's show, and I'm delighted to welcome another debut author in today's episode. If you enjoy the show or indeed any other shows on the Words and Nerds platform, jump online and give us a thumbs up five-star review wherever you are listening. Thank you for listening to us and for supporting the Australian book industry. You can also find any books mentioned in today's podcast down in the description. Today I'm joined by Mark Wales, formerly of the Australian Special Forces. He's a veteran, now a corporate speaker, TV reality star, actor and author of the memoir Survivor. However, we're here today to talk about his brand new fiction debut, Outrider, published by Pan Macmillan, which you can get a copy of right now in the description. Kicking off this discussion, I asked Mark about his experiences of transitioning over from writing memoir and pulling from his own experiences to crafting worlds of fiction, and also how being on the set of an exciting blockbuster film inspired his writing. I am super delighted to welcome Mark Wales to date with a debut. Mark, welcome. Nick, thanks for having me, mate. So, I mean, we're going in on a technicality here because we were alluding to a little bit earlier, just before we started talking, that this is your first fiction debut. Uh, But you originally had also written Survivor, uh, which was kind of how I first heard of you um, down the grapevine a couple of years ago. Um, first of all, how was the transition? How does it was it was it a strange experience as a writer? <laughs> I got to admit, I was pretty cocky after I wrote uh, Survivor. You know, it sold pretty well. I did the manuscript pretty quickly. I was like, you know, this fiction stuff. How hard can it be? Um, turns out very hard <laughs> when you've got to actually create the world and you've got to create the characters and and the narrative arc. Uh, it's it's twi- I think it's twice as much work, really, probably even more. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, but it's rewarding as well. And I think, in terms of in terms of a market, I think there is a much greater market attached to kind of escapism fiction um, compared to kind of narrative nonfiction, which is more kind of niche. I think. Yeah, um, I also just want to ask before we actually dive into talking about the book and the characters and the setting, the Australia that you have created in it. Um, I re- read with interest. Uh, I'm an, uh, a massive Mad Max fan, and you immediately know where this comes. Yeah, there it is. He knows exactly where this is going. And I know that you appeared in Furiosa, um, and I know that they wrapped up filming, obviously, quite a while ago. Uh, but please tell me that I, I don't want to say, like, again, colouring my enjoyment of of Outrider, but I got <laughs> there was some Mad Max little ta- little Easter egg stuff. Tell me, you, were you writing it while you were on set? <laughs> so I was about a third of the way through the manuscript and then i went on on to the set of the uh, it was a couple of years back now it was like we filmed it like over 18 months ago um and i had to pause my writing for a bit but i but even better than that i got to stand in george miller's creation as a character which Ooh. when you're a when you're a writer there's just nothing better and and the small the details of the set and the characters that he built and even talking to actors there was there was a top actor there that told me how he thought about his character. And he goes, I think my character harbors these demons and he's motivated by this. Hearing hearing those things, which never made it to the screen, but it's such a key component of how that character managed himself on screen. Mate, it was a, it was a storyteller's dream to be in that in that world. So I was, uh, and mate, just a, a film nerd's dream to be uh, in Mad Max. So, yeah, we, uh, How much of a fan were you? How much of a huge, family, mate, huge yeah. fan. Yeah, loved it. I said, if there's only one film I ever do, it would have to be a Mad Max film. <laughs> I was, I, I haven't had the chance to see it yet, but I was obsessed with Fury Road when it came out. Oh. Not just because of, you know, it's just a barrage, but 
it's the storytelling. It's the it, it tickles my writer head because it's the visual storytelling that is happening mm. in the background. The entire world they've created and everything. Almost like, no dialogue as well. Yeah, like, like it's like a western almost. It's 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 incredible how he does it. Yeah, George. Well, why we we can just aspire to be like George Miller because my Mate, God, we we got a copy of the proof to him. I, I feel like we left it a bit late because he was flat out <laughs> in final editing. We were, we were gunning for a, a cover quote, but we just couldn't get one. But maybe if uh, if we get a reprint, fingers crossed, we can uh, get George Miller on the cover. <laughs> I certainly hope so because uh, what a ringing endorsement from uh, the creator <laughs> of, of the Mad Max world himself. <laughs> Without further ado, though, let's let us dive into Outrider. And I first of all just want to, you know, we usually start these kind of discussions by giving you the classic elevator pitch. So what is Outrider about? Well, Outrider is about a father and a son trying to escape a civil war set in the near future in Australia. And it's about the, 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 the drama and the tension of trying to protect a child while there's a war going on all around you. Mm. It's a. I love that you've you've kept it succinct and kept it to the mm. point because uh, we don't we try to stay as spoiler free as possible. But mm. um, I love kind of the opening kind of settings that you gave us with some really simple stuff. First of all, for for any lovers out there, you've got a map, which are uh, right at the start of the, of the book. <laughs> which I don't know. I'm just a sucker for maps. Um, and just the fact that you had actually put it for everyone who's kind of seeing it on YouTube. I'm putting it up to the screen, <laughs> but like how you've actually got different areas. You're highlighting which particular parts of Australia are uh, occupied territories, an area that's no man's land, um, and as, as well as free Australia, which is kind of this area that is an end point that that uh, that Jack and Harry are trying to get to. Um, my God, a lot, a lot <laughs> to unpack the, here. The map freaked me out a bit when I saw it. I was like, ooh, I, I didn't... <laughs> That's a bit nasty, isn't it? Like where a, a country's kind of half occupied. I was a little bit worried. I'm like, oh, this might be a bit more nasty than I thought. But as soon as you see that map, you know this is a different world. It's a different time, yes. and uh, it's good. It's kind of a, a nightmare come come to life, and that's where that escapism and drama comes from. Mm. Maybe it's the 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 like. Sometimes I find myself going to sleep at night uh, listening to things like war graphics and hearing about what actual hypotheticals could it look like, for example, if mm. Australia was invaded mm. um, and that how it actually is quite a difficult, challenging uh, terrain to, even though we haven't got a huge population, how difficult it is to navigate. Um, but in this world, uh, it's 2029. Um, I believe it started with a war in Taiwan is where the boot, once the boots got on the, on the ground in Taiwan, everything just went to shit. Uh, and the first thing I want to ask you about is actually crafting action on the page. Uh, we were talking about it before we started recording, but obviously immediately I, I went to Survivor as my framework to, to, to examine how you kind of crafted this. But there was a real sense of you, you treaded a line, which I really like. You know, a lot of people will, will think of Matthew Riley as, the, as some of the great action writers, but there was something a lot more grounded in how you wrote your action, your action scenes and the, the the visceral nature of it. Tell me a little bit about that and, and that process. Um, so I, I don't know where I got this from. I think it was from Stephen King on writing. He goes, look, you don't need to explain everything to the reader. You can really just offer some anchor points and let them paint the rest of the picture themselves. It, it really is, you almost say more with that scene than you do if you're trying to explain it in detail. So he was kind of saying, look, don't treat your readers like idiots. Let them construct some of the world um, based off a couple of anchors that you give them. <clears throat> and um, I tr just tried to add some of the details that w I remember when I was in combat, there were certain tiny things I can remember, like, and I put them in the book, like the feel of a checked grip in your hand when you're holding a rifle or um, the feeling when you're running, right? How your legs feel when you're in combat or... Um, the, the look on someone's face if you see someone at close range you know and you're in you're in contact those little things um they're only small details but they say a lot about what's happening in that particular scene and, and some of the desperation and that's that's just try how i tried to conduct the scenes like not over explain it but give enough so that people could um feel like they were there I found myself being more connected to Jack. I mean, obviously, you, you, your view, a lot of the story is viewed from his mindset, but I really got a sense of who he was more of a person through his action. 
like the way he actually approaches action uh, as kind of this as this special operations soldier um, and kind of in this in this resistance group. It, that put, the space that Jack is in this headspace, even before we get to the situation with his son, is already battle hardened, drilled to the point, um, but also a clear focus with what he's trying to do with any objective or goal that he has in front of him. Yeah, he's almost got that kind of on switch um, that, that you see in those top units or first responders. But in the backdrop, he's also, he's older. He's been at it for a long time. He's, he's, yeah. It's in his home. He's trying to build a life as well. He's not perfect. He makes mistakes um, in battle and, and whatnot. And those little things, I think, just make him that little bit more relatable. Mm. One other thing that I've really, like the moment that you, because one of the early moments, and I think this is not a spoiler when we say this, is one of the very first scenes we have with him is with his wife, uh, who, of course, uh, is she's she's in his arms. Um, and, and, and that's all that really needs to be said. And so you get a real driving sense of, of him as a person. And then you contrast that with Harry um, in, in this as well, which adds another dynamic. Tell me about, like, a bit, first of all, about... Because with that particular setting, Harry very much would colour a lot of the ways that Jack looks at the world and the focus of that. Tell me about that dynamic between that you, that you had between Jack and Harry and how that was kind of crafted. Yeah, so Jack has already suffered a serious loss in his family. His son is his only, his only real close family left um, and he wants to protect him at all costs. <clears throat> He wants to protect him, but he also wants him to be with him all the time so that um, he's not left to his own devices and, and Jack feels that uh, sense of responsibility towards him. Um, Harry was a hard character to fill out. He had to be innocent. He had to also be intelligent and see the world in a different way to his father. I think it's a good contrast. You've got that kind of young innocence and then you've got a father that's probably seen too much. And he's trying to preserve that that innocence in his in his son while teaching him that the world as we know it in australia is now totally different that's what i think really really brought it home the contrast not just because of for us as a reader um i found myself really being drawn to harry because harry was familiar with the world that we know now a world that is not consumed by war and not consumed by uh, a lot of uh, things that you look on the news and you see it everywhere, but we're very lucky here in Australia that that we we live in such a peaceful place and a place that has not uh, seen such conflict. Um, and I thought I found it quite a, a valuable framing device uh, in terms of just looking at Harry as a person and how it helped me latch onto him and also why Jack does what he does. Yeah, and you can see some of Harry's intrigue about what he's seeing, and that's just, it's the same thing I had when when I was a kid. You think it's it's cool seeing all these soldiers and the combat and the machinery, <clears throat> but behind that curtain is a bit of a horror show, and and Jack knows that, and he's trying to he's trying to keep his son from from witnessing too much of it. So we have uh, the parts of Australia um, that are occupied um, that we have to go through. We have no man's land or the kind of that that area that is like right in the center of Australia, but then we also have free Australia uh, and these particular different environments and settings that you create with all of them uh, as, as we make our way through this story. First of all, just seeing, I mean, I, I, for me who has not experienced combat and not been in that environment, seeing these, the, this land that I have grown up in uh, transformed was, uh, well, I mean, it takes you back. It really does. I mean, it is an action story and a fictional story, but it also takes you back a bit, um, imagining what such a scenario could look like uh, in folding in front of your eyes. But I imagine for you, it probably would not have been as as difficult given that setting. But what was it like transforming your own homeland into that? It was sort great of fun. It was great fun because mm. I've had those thoughts. I'm like, what would actually happen? Like, how would if a resistance formed in the country? Where would it be? What would it look like? How would society reorganize itself? That to me is a really interesting question. You, it happens in countries all the time, uh, Israel, Ukraine, these countries that are, you know, their existence is a threat. They reorganize their society and the roles that people play, the occupations, they're all, they all become geared towards survival. 
And that's kind of what I enjoyed about this is like you get to pull away some of the, the facades we've built around our world in the 21st century. They all go away. And what's left is tribes and survival and hope. And that's it. It, it def- definitely felt like a different... I mean, it still felt like the Australia that we're familiar with, but uh, it did almost feel like a character in itself. Um, the, the landscape itself and the way that you, you crafted the war-torn Australia. Um, I have actually no question to say here. I just found it uh, so engrossing. Um, and also, obviously, a place that as much as, as the actual forces that, that, that are at stake... Um, was as much itself a key part for Jack and Harry's journey. Mate, that that makes my day because it was uh, it was an <laughs> undertaking having to build it. But I mean, the other thing that the other thing that I was working hard to avoid was that kind of trope of uh, kind of fo- you know, alien invaders. Yeah, um, I wanted to avoid that, and I think I, I wanted to overemphasize um, the Australian division. I wanted because that to me is is way more. Is, is way is way more relatable and far more scary than some painting some alien force uh, some alien invader um, coming to the country and taking it over that, that to me is kind of an old-fashioned uh, story that's kind of well worn whereas the whole civil war piece that to me is far more concerning absolutely it's like you, you... The the whole sometimes you know some there is there is of course the the threat of the invader but the civil world the civil war itself this is this is people who know this land like you yeah um, it's like someone at a checkpoint wearing a Adelaide Crows jersey holding a automatic weapon like that to me is a terrifying vision yeah more, more <laughs> yes. the Adelaide Crows jersey than the weapon but <laughs> the... <laughs> but um, you know just little things like that I thought were is an interesting a kind of place to go to. I know, and, and I love that that would, that would be immediately one of my first reactions as well. It's like, you go for that team? Fuck me. <laughs> Clearly a villain. <laughs> Clearly a villain. A villain. Uh, I can honestly, I really do want to dive into the book a little bit more, but I want to keep it spoiler-free as possible. Um, and instead, I want to kind of also pivot a little bit uh, to your writing journey um, about with this, creating this fiction world particularly. Um Obviously, the contrast between writing a memoir with Survivor is is very different to writing fiction. And you did touch on it a little bit earlier. How it's you know a lot of world building, a lot of a lot of stuff, uh, extra stuff around that uh, when crafting this. Talk to me about the actual process when you kind of sat down with this scenario. First of all, where the hell did this scenario kind of come from? It had always been sitting in the back of your head. And then once you did that, and you kind of had this story, and you and you presented it to Pam McMillan, what was how was it like? crafting it and putting it together mate i i thought about this i thought about this story at some point it was actually during it was actually during the lockdowns in melbourne i was like imagine if and my editor is going to hate me for this he's like don't talk about covid um people don't want to hear about it but i was like what if the basic functions of society just went away and so we we couldn't feed people we had no energy we had no there were no first respond all the all the services that we have just disappeared i was like well that'd be a pretty interesting scenario and, and what would happen if a state completely collapsed economically like would we be open to some sort of foreign interference who knows and so i come up with these ideas and i'm like well hang on what if we what if all the things we were doing overseas as a country we brought back to australia and had a scenario play out where you know it's someone else playing with our country um it's and we're in the middle of this game we're, we're pawns in this game being played by a much larger power um that could be such an interesting world and and that would it would totally change our country it would change our society and um that was the premise of the story i'm like let's build a world where part of australia's collapse part is taken over people are just trying to survive and we've all just broken down to these little tribes it's yeah and it just that i love that that is what you of course it came during during covid um (laughs) Like so many stories and so many particular stories of like a certain nature arrived while we were all sitting at home uh, in that set down. So I'm not surprised that this was a COVID book uh, that, that arrived out of the, out of the, out of the blue. Uh, what was it like with Pam McMillan? Kind of, you, did you, did you take it to them or did you have the manuscript completed after you had Survivor? And then once you had that, uh, I know that the, the back and forth, because obviously it would have been a, a new experience for you, even though you were, touching on subject matter that you are very familiar with obviously yeah. as you alluded to 
fiction is is another beast to memoir. It's a, it's a big pivot, and I had this discussion with my editor. So it's uh, Alex Lloyd at Pam McMillan. He's actually Matthew Riley's editor as well, which is where the map came from. That was Alex's idea. So um, good uh, shout out to Alex. But Alex <laughs> said, oh, and I've been thinking about another book for a while, and I'd had this idea about doing a nonfiction book on kind of leadership and that complements my kind of speaking career. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, I just couldn't get excited about it. But I had this other idea about fiction where Australian society kind of collapses into this civil war and a father and a son are trying to escape it. And uh, I was way more excited by that. And when I pitched it to Alex, he's like, I think this is good. Why don't you write a treatment up and I'll I'll take it to the, um, to the team. I think they have monthly kind of round tables where they pitch stories that they want to acquire. And so Mm -hmm. They already knew me from the nonfiction book. They knew I could deliver, but it's it is a big step going into fiction. So um, I wrote up about a ten thousand word treatment, and um, Alex took it to the table. And they're like, "Let's go, let's do it." <laughs> Was there anything that surprised you, like writing fiction? Yeah, it was the mental horsepower needed to because it feels like you kind of simultaneously interpreting you're having to think up this world and these characters you're having to get them to act in a certain way and then you have to translate it all to the page so it's there's a lot happening kind of mentally and and it takes a lot of you have to be absorbed in it for a long time i'd set my writing time at about three hours a day but i would be thinking about it for the rest of the day i'd be like how do i want that scene to unfold you know what's this person going to do what's a good twist and, and that would take up a lot of my time outside of writing. So I found like, I felt like all the setup was happening between writing and writing. I'd just execute what I'd thought about. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and it's how handy as well that you had Alex there alongside you, um, particularly just as a, such an experienced head when it comes to editing other quality books. Did Matthew actually, did Matthew get the chance to check out uh, an early version of, uh, of Outrider? I, I don't think we got him a, well, maybe we did. Alex was, was onto that, but I think he was pretty busy with another, one of his own projects. So, I mean, he's, he's probably busy. a bit more, yeah, yeah. He'd be pretty, you know, he'd be flat out. So, um, but we got a few, we got a lot of proofs sent out. So that was, that was good. I appreciate Jack, uh, that you got Jack Heath, uh, the seal of approval from, uh, from him. Cause I, I'm a big <laughs> Mate, fan of him. I think he's great. Mate, what a, what a compliment coming from him. And it's, and it's so nice to have established authors helping out kind of up, you know, up and coming or new authors. I think that's a really nice thing for, for them to do. Mm. What's, uh, what's next? Will we see, I, I feel like when I, as I was kind of coming to the end of this, this story, I got the feeling that we're going to see more of Jack. Of Jack Dunn, uh, will there be more? <laughs> Mate, I've already already outlined uh, another book. Uh, you know, if this one goes well, um, there's certainly scope uh, for more Jack Dunn. I think I've left it open. You know, there's there's another part. There are other parts of Australia that uh, are totally open and are facing their own issues. So I'm sure Jack Dunn and Harry can go there and uh, maybe help out a bit. <laughs> I feel like I feel like with the world that you've created, we've got to see more. Like I want I want to Mate, see more. This this has a long way to run. I think it's it's fun in that sense. You've, and especially even with Harry, like he's a young man now, but in the years that come, he'll become a, a young fighter perhaps or a politician, who knows. Mm, indeed. We like to finish off the podcast with a quick fire rapid fire section where I just throw a bunch of questions at you. And you give me the first answer that comes to your head. So what we'll do is we'll kick off. I, I think when I in my in the treatment I sent to you earlier, I gave you prep for a two uh, of the of the starting questions in regards to your book tastes and things that you've been yes. enjoying. Yes. So I want to hit you with your the first question, which is, what is your favourite book that you have read in the last twelve months? Oh, you know, not a non-fiction one, which is actually kind of old now, but it's called Blind Man's Bluff. And it's a submarine warfare book that came out in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing the bookshelf, uh, when I was at the defense Academy, I never read it. I finally bought it and it is a, it is a cracking read. It's really good. Mm, I, I, I've never heard of blind man's bluff, but I mean, that sounds like I, as, as a to, I want to improve my action, right? My action reading, uh, capabilities and, uh, and, and new books. So another one to add to the TBR pile. That's about yeah. <laughs> five meters high. <laughs> and the other one that I've, I've reread and just love is uh, blood Meridian by Colin. Oh Miller. yes. Yeah. That's and a I, great. I just think, 
mate, there's a it's a before and after moment in life reading that book. It's it's such a good depiction of of uh, really an apocalypse. But the, he's the such West, a good back writer. In the 1800s, he's so good. Mm. Yeah, he's such a good writer. I love it. Some the of late, my favorite. Great. Yeah, mm. the great late. It's it's so many, uh, so many great ac- moments of action and and great ideas of stories have come out of 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 his hands, and it's just oh, I love it. I love it so much. What's your favorite debut novel that you've ever read? <laughs> Ready Player One. Oh that, that yes, was, that was a, a cracker, and I have to, I. I give him so much credit for his world building because that again was a really great effort and and the way he built <clears throat> not just a real world but a virtual world as well plus all the kind of pop culture references that went along I think that was a really good effort mm. yeah it's just not just the fact that it's all happening in the inside the oasis and everything yeah. like that but just <laughs> Part of me had always wondered when when they were going to adapt it to a film. It's like the amount of, mu- of yeah. budget that would have been set for IP uh, yeah. in all that intellectual property, insane. <laughs> but it, oh, yeah, it's great. It's, it's such a great story. Did you read the second one? I did. I didn't love it. I didn't love the second one. But mm. I mean, what, how was it received critically? The second one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like I, I feel like he spent a long time on the first one, and I feel like maybe he got. A, a bit more pressure with the second one to bring that out quicker. I think the second one's hard, right? Because people are under a bit more of a time pressure and maybe expectations. So, yeah, I think it depends on the yeah. Mm. I, I think it depends on the person because some people, for example, if you you know planned out a trilogy or whatever, and the first one is really successful, the second one can often be the one where you have, feel no pressure because you know that mm. whatever it is, it's people are going to work it and, and and roll with it. But uh, each their own. Another. Or- Another author I've kept an eye on is um, Jack Carr. So, and he's got that very, uh, you know, Michael, is it Michael? I can't remember the comparison authors, um, but he's, he's done really well. He's ex Navy SEAL. He's written some great kind of action books, very revenge based, uh, probably a little bit flag wavy for my liking, but still, still really good, good reads. And uh, yeah, he's done an amazing job with, with just the commercial side of it. Hmm. Well, love the sound of those. Do you have a favourite word? Oh. <laughs> um, I don't have a favourite word, but oh no, there was a couple I was overusing in the book. Filthy <laughs> for some reason. Filthy. Uh, Alex is like, you've yeah, no, find something else. You've overused it. Um, that was one. And then uh, there's an ed- editor I keep reading who who seems to use the word grotesque like every couple of paragraphs in his editorials. I'm like, mate, you've got to dial that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, sometimes, I do love that. Sometimes you can get just, you can get pulled towards a particular work if you, yep. in trying to <laughs> nail a setting or an environment. A gritty, I like, yeah, that, I think that's a filthy, filthy is a good way to describe filthy. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if there was one particular story, um, like whether it be a, a story about, uh, you know, from a military background or action-based story or book that you think is underrated, what do you think it is? Um, oh, that's a good one. That's a good question because there's some there's some cracker reads out there that I felt were a bit underrated. Um, mm. Probably one is, I think Cormac McCarthy's last two that he released just before he died. Um to me, when I read it, I'm like, this doesn't have the heft of some of his earlier work, but I still think he was in such a different part of his life. He was old. He knew he was kind of at the end of his life. So they are more philosophical in that sense. And I think in time, they'll be recognized as some of his greatest work. Mm, I love Cormac McCarthy's last couple of books. I mean, yeah. My, yeah I mean, before Blood and Reading, my, my Way In was No Country for Old Men. Mm. Um, and... It, yeah, and I can't believe that that like apparently critics were a bit off on the book when it came out because I just went, this is amazing. Like, no, no, that was such a like Spartan and and the best villain I've seen probably ever. And actually, when they made the film, they actually they wanted the, the guy's hair to look like one of the Crusaders. Some of the old images mm. and paintings they'd seen of Crusaders had hair like that, and um, that summed him up because he really was someone that believed in you know, some greater cause, but he was, he was such a villain. Oh, uh, great movie, great story. Yeah. All of it, to be honest. And then of course, I mean, the road as well as a, as a, mm. another personal favorite, but yeah, no, I'm 
glad you you mentioned Stella Stella Maris and the passenger. Yes, those are the lot. Yes, yeah. The other one that's a bit underrated, I think, especially if you're interested in writing, is uh, on writing by Stephen King. That to me was mm. the most. It's part. It's it's a memoir really, but it's it's an encouraging story about his journey with writing and his tips for writers as well. And I guess. Yeah, to me it was such a, it was such an inspiring read that that got me into writing. Really, I, I've been thinking about it for ages, and then when I read that, I'm like, right, I think I'll get started. It's it's a great read. It'll galvanise you when if you mm. if you're in that writing rut. Mm. Mm. You get into a lift, and your ultimate the person you've always wanted to meet is in there. Who is it? Oh. <laughs> probably, probably. Charlie Saron from Fury Road. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I've yes. met George Miller. I was going to say George Miller, but I'm like, look, I've, I've met him already, so I'm lucky. But Charlie Saron, haven't met her, but uh, would you know? Obviously, wouldn't be a bad person to get into a lift with, and uh, you know, hear hear her stories. Now, now I just want to know, like, okay, let's let's do a spontaneous extra question. You've got, <laughs> you're going up to like, I don't know. She's got you're going up one floor and you've got time for one question. What would you ask her? Uh, not what floor are you going to? <laughs> are, you, are you coming back for the uh, Fury Road sequel? <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, you, her and Tom Hardy. I, I hope they'll be back. <laughs> I hope so. I know that the, the whole making of that movie was chaotic as all hell and they, mm. they had a, a rough time on it, but I know that the view they look at that time very differently uh, mm. now so yeah fingers crossed um and then last question uh before we wrap up are you happy yes mate i am uh you know especially after tearing my hair out on on this book for a long time this is uh <laughs> to get to the end and do the release work that's when it becomes a team sport and uh as you know any sort of writing can be it's hard because you can't really share it. You can't really talk about it that much because there's no point. The story's not finished. But uh, when it's done and you start working on the release material, that's when the, the fun yeah, really starts. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad to hear it. And I'm glad that uh, by the time everyone listens to this, this beautiful book will be out in the world. If you ha- if you can, go and get yourself a copy of, our, of Outrider by Mark Wales. It is gritty. It is brutal, but it is also absolutely enthralling. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. Nick, thanks, mate. And congrats on the podcast. It's a, it's a great idea and I'm so glad you're doing it for debut authors. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Date With A Debut and for listening to the Words and Nerds channel. You can buy all books mentioned in today's episode down in the description box. And if you enjoyed the show or indeed any episode of Words and Nerds, drop us a review, leave us five stars or a thumbs up. It is hugely appreciated. Catch you soon.